I'm Pixie. I'm Sun. And I'm Pyrosim. And welcome to Nerd Talk. There's a new class in Borderlands 2, the Mechromancer. We've been talking about it for like five minutes, but uh, we forgot to start recording. Whoops. <laughs> so now you get to talk about it again. <laughs> she is named Gage. I'm excited that there's another female character. I know, right? Because Borderlands, both the original and number two, suffered a little bit from, quote, Smurfette syndrome, where it's like, being a girl is a unique property. Like, femaleness is something that only one member of a population can have. And that it's, yeah, it's othering. Well, in universe, though, there's kind of an interesting thing about that. I was interested to hear in the Assassinate the Assassins mission that there can only be six sirens in the Borderlands universe, and the class siren has been inherited for both of them. But that does not justify why there's not a female you know, lunkhead or gun user or what have you. Well, now we've got one. So we've got Gage, who's kind of the punk rock mechanic of the Borderlands 2 uh, selection. She has a buddy, and I feel like I'm kind of duplicated as the commando because I have my buddy, the turret. What is her buddy? Her buddy is a robot named Death Trap that she can summon every uh, 90 seconds. I'm not quite sure how long he lasts. I think that's up to how you've leveled your skill trees. But, uh, yeah, he can be leveled to either have uh, regenerative powers, uh, shields, have giant lasers that he fires out of his face, or just run up and punch things. However you want to work him. Uh, depending on what skill trees you pick, which there's a, a few options that the game's creators have perhaps misspoken in uh, labeling, but the uh, the tree called Best Friends Forever is a skill tree that is specifically designed to be newbie-friendly. So it's a bit of a double entendre here, because the um, bad way that it was put by the public relations, the producer, was girlfriend mode. And so I assume that this tree... Uh, specializes in making Death Trap stronger. Yeah, it, it makes Death Trap basically do all of the work for you. Where... So the double entendre is that the best friend is if you are less skilled at the game, then this is basically the easiest skill tree. You'll yeah. have the least difficulty getting through the... Well, with this one, you can basically just summon Death Trap and then follow your friend around. And Death Trap and your friend will do the majority of the work while you're contributing by having Death Trap there. So allegedly, it would be good for amateurs in a multiplayer setting. Yep. And you don't have to bring down the hardcores by being bad. But likewise, uh, Gage seems to be interestingly designed because she also has what's been hinted at as the hardest skill tree in the game. Uh, the Ordered Chaos skill tree, which is specifically designed to consume stacks of... Uh, of the different elemental powers. Stacks? Yeah, if the she, word stacks comes into play, then you know you're dealing with tryhards. Well, she actually creates uh, her own resource called Anarchy, which goes up as you fire your gun. It increases damage, but lowers the accuracy. All right. So that sounds like it might combine crazily with the um, particular weapon manufacturer whose guns get more accurate the more you fire. Uh, that would be Hyperion. Hyperion, who encourages you to use all of your bullets. And likewise, their, their other skill tree, Little Big Trouble, uh, is just designed to do enormous area of effect destruction. So, I am definitely going to switch to this class immediately, and because of that, I am kind of happy that I am playing the PC version, because I don't either have the time or interest to grind through the first 15 levels again, so I'm going to be honest, I'm going to roll a level 1 Necromancer and memory edit her to be level 15 and blast <laughs> through the low-level content. Um, but I'm glad I'm playing on the PC for two reasons. Because I can skip that, and also, I didn't get my save deleted. Yeah, apparently Xbox Live users have been having problems with that. Best of luck to you guys. There's some bugs in this patch 
um, that can have symptoms randomly, and this seems like it's not happening to everybody or even a large portion of the population, but it can have side effects such as completely deleting your character, um, simply resetting your skill tree but giving you the skills to distribute, so a free respec, um, or just taking all your skills and not giving them back to you, so you get no skills. <laughs> Or things like deleting your golden keys. So maybe you pre-ordered, and this patch, just because it was buggy, took away your pre-order bonus. Yep. Um, so those of you who did pre-order will be receiving the patch for free. Uh, also, anyone who bought the collector's edition. However, as a, a nice bonus, those of us who didn't pre-order, myself included, um, if you do buy the DLC for Gage you will then have access to the yellow guns that pre-order players started the game with, as well as the key that's just included in the content. Oh, that's nice. Um, huh. I feel like I want an extra golden key for this. Because... <laughs> you don't feel special anymore? Yeah. I mean, like, I'm, <laughs> I'm the golden boy, and you're giving other people golden keys that I, I cannot have no matter what? Well, I paid oh. ten more dollars than you. So, yeah. Yeah, but I pre ordered. But I also don't actually feel bad about it because I have a memory editor. <laughs> and so I have 99 golden keys. All of the golden keys. So, can you only use the golden key once per account? Is that what it is? Or is it every uh, time you, you can, start a character? You can only use it one? once. It, it gets consumed by opening the chest, and then it is done. Right, that and is then, the cost of opening it. So when you open the chest, is does the item like scale to your current level? Like, is Correct. it worth? Yes. So it's worth waiting to open the chest until later in the game. That is yes. the whole point. Except, n basically, nobody knew that, and so a lot of us wasted our keys by opening it because we went, "Oh, a chest!" and we've been condi conditioned by the game to just open all chests. There's the only indication that a chest will consume a golden key is it'll the pop-up that says open chest has a tiny little uh, one key logo next to it and there's no confirm because the general gameplay in that loop is that you just go tapping the activate button constantly. There is That is the only time in the whole game that something will be in front of you that you don't want to hit activate on. And so it would probably make sense for them to have put a confirm screen there but Again, no skin off my back because I have 99 golden keys, and the way that works for me is that I can open the chest, and there will be probably like two purple items in there, and I'll pick them up, and then the chest will close itself again, and then I hit activate, and it opens right back up, and it has new items inside. Pyro is now griefing Borderlands 2. Uh, as a re I... The, that was the most recent thing I did in Borderlands 2, and I, I did it on a level 10 character, so even fully decked out in purples, my level 10 cannot roll with, like, a level 18. But Which we've um, tried. <laughs> we've proven that. But, my assassin has had so much fun running around with that poor little commando. <laughs> I just run up, and then I die, and then... Something else dies, and then I get a second wind, and then something. Then I die, and then Sen comes and revives me. Oh, I've gotten to the point where I feel like I'm practically cheating playing my assassin. I've got a purple shield on him that it causes an explosion every time the shield is uh, destroyed, and every time my health is depleted. So pretty much it's impossible for my character to go down in melee. Because as soon as his health goes to zero, the shield explodes, which probably kills the thing that was attacking him, and therefore he gets a second wind, which restores him to full shields. Yeah, it, it's next to impossible for this character to die uh, in close combat. It just it's an impressive sight happen. to watch. But yeah, the thing is that I got the... there's achievements. There's both an achievement and a number of quests for picking up a certain number of purple items, and I was just like, so many purple items. I also memory edited myself a lot of money just so I could do the tipping moxie thing. See, I've actually just got the money to do that. Yeah, money money does not do anything in Borderlands, because yeah. ammo is so cheap and drops are better than vendor weapons. 
and so it's, mem- it's m- utterly guaranteed that uh, in order to resurrect yourself, it only takes like a maximum of ten percent of your total money. Right. In fact, it is it is like guaranteed ten percent unless you're a certain below a. Oh, like it, it's ramping. It's like a tax structure. That's right. Uh, but, but that means if you've got like you know ten million dollars in game, then you know you die and you lose like two mil. Yep. Which you weren't using for anything else besides resurrecting after a certain point in the game. Well, there's absolutely nothing to spend money on. I have never. I am level seventeen, and I have never bought ammo. <laughs> I've gotten all of my ammunition exclusively from drops. I do because I'm a fan of one specific weapon type that I use constantly. See, I just rotate. I rotate constantly. And if you do ever run out of ammo and decide to go to an ammo dump vending machine and fill up, you will find that to fill up every ammo type to the maximum capacity, even if you have ammo decks, costs like $20. <laughs> It's like one mob kill worth of money. It's so cheap. Yeah, I, I constantly pour money into my, uh, into my submachine guns, and yet, at no point do I ever feel like I'm in danger of running out. So you know, refilling on ammo costs approximately the same amount that it would cost to get the new Humble Ebook Bundle with all of the bonus items. The average price for the Humble Ebook Bundle, which is available now, it just started, and so. You have 12 days as of this broadcast to pick it up. It has eight ebooks in it, which I'm looking at this, and I know at least that Kelly Link's Magic for Beginners, which is on this shelf, was Creative Commons and kind of freely available. So I don't feel bad about supporting the author, but you could already have downloaded that for free. I see a Cory Doctorow book on there, and his books are usually CC licensed as well. But in any case, these are... there's. Four books by recognizable authors. I'm excited to get to reading them. One, if you, the two that you get if you pay above the average, are by John Scalzi and Neil Gaiman, respectively, Ooh, which are Gaiman far and away the biggest names on the list. I'm interested that the bonus level, which is the average donation amount, is just about twelve dollars right now which is kind of way higher than it has been for any of the game bundles. Uh, by right now we mean Tuesday night when we're recording this, but... Right. So right now when you're actually hearing this, it could be more or less. You will see when you go to donate what the threshold is to get the bonus books, but it is strange that it is way higher than it has been for games, because books are relatively cheaper to produce. I love how Will Wheaton was... Outbitted by his own clown sweater. <laughs> by one cent. That's pretty awesome. The first humble indie bundles were characterized by bidding wars between Notch and some random person on Twitter who, like, I followed because of his bidding wars on the humble indie bundle. And then it was like there was nothing interesting at all about him. He just had, like, $8,000 to throw at this. It's like, oh, well. Okay. But people can put anything they want in that top contributor box and or in the name to associate with the contribution box. And as a result, it's a funny leaderboard to watch. It also seems they kind of haven't updated their architecture because donations are still split up by Mac, Windows, and Linux, which are kind of irrelevant to the fact that you're buying books and not software. But it's there. But yeah, this is really cool, and this is the first time they've done this with books. They've always done it with games, and so this is a really interesting new direction. Uh, I'm anxious to see how this turns out, and hopefully it generates the same kind of buzz that the video game once did, and then we can get more books out this way. And hey, we like reading. I like when other people read. Absolutely. And one thing I am most most fascinated about here is the fact that these are DRM-free, which actually matters like, in a way more substantive way to the average consumer for books than even for games, because uh, there's two major e-ink reading devices on the market right now, and I believe Sen has a Kindle, and I personally am in possession of a Nook simple touch reader, and as a result of that, I buy my books from Barnes & Noble, 
And if, say, the Kindle Paperwhite came out with a super high-contrast screen, and I'm like, yeah, I want that high-contrast display, I can't get the high-contrast display because I can't put my Barnes & Noble books on my Kindle device without, of course, circumventing the DRM, which I, being a handsome computer genius, do, but the regular consumer could not reasonably be expected to do. Books are also sort of a funny place for DRM to still pervade. I, I credit it to the fact that ebooks are the last format to become super popular digitally. Like, ebooks in the popular mind are only like four years old. They're, they existed before that, but nobody liked them. And so there was a big transition where music got DRM free, uh, mostly when iTunes made the switch. And since then, music has pretty much just been DRM free and the industry has not collapsed. But ebooks still are. As a result, you have vendor lock in. Not with the humble ebook bundle. Well, unfortunately, books are one of those subjects where people are still polar on the digital versus standard. People are still polar, but I, I've. I feel like it's coming more to a consensus and. This I'm quoting Joshua Topolsky from The Verge podcast when he said, I am going to do all of my reading on my Kindle, but I'm still going to buy books on paper and put them on my shelf and not read them. And maybe buy a digital copy and read the digital copy. I'm, I'm going to buy paper books, but it's just so much better of an experience to be able to carry your entire library on an airplane with you. Right. That that's going to win. Um, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to say that is strange about ebooks retaining DRM is that the DRM on ebooks is trivial to break. And it's freaking text! Just, it's just dumb! Exactly. The analog hole for ebooks is that you hire a minimum wage worker to sit in front of two monitors and type the ebook into a text file. And if one person does that once and uploads it to Pirate Bay, then it's available for the whole internet forever. And it's like, the internet is so big that if you're, say, Harry Potter, somebody's gonna do that. It's just so dumb. It's so dumb, guys. Exactly. I can't get my head around how dumb that is. And so the DRM is just... Useless. It cannot ever work. It, it will always be trivial to circumvent. The only thing it does is be a hassle to people who actually purchase books with money. I wanted to mention, and I had last week that it was coming, but now it's here. It's totally here. Uh, Mass Effect 3 Retaliation just came out uh, two days ago as of this broadcast. And holy cow, is it intense and crazy, and you need to get your hands on it, like, immediately. I hear there is a certain heavy breathing race that you can play as. Yeah, that didn't get mentioned last week, but I really feel like it should have because I would have been definitely more That's sold on this idea. That's because we didn't know. We didn't know right? until today. I'm not complaining about us. I'm complaining about Bioware here. Like, why no, would this you was a surprise. That? Because it's a surprise. It was free DLC anyway. They didn't need to sell people on it. Please tell me that they don't sprint as fast as the other races. I haven't hey, got who to is play this? one. You can play the as the Volus, Volus now. Ooh. The short, heavy breathing suited race that complains that, you know, if our suits are punctured, we're dead. Because they've got. Uh, you know, it happens. I think they're from a nitrogen Volus based atmosphere. are basically right. grunts from Halo. Deep insights. Except they're more intelligent and don't speak in that little whiny voice. <laughs> True. But they do breathe nitrogen out of suits. Yep, so you've got yummy, the yummy Turians, nitrogen. And you've got uh, you've got two Turian classes. Uh, oh, I'm looking Ghost forward to this DLC. And the Havoc, yes. Um those are playable character classes. And then there's there are a couple of Volus classes. One's a biotic and one's an engineer. I don't know what the names of those are, but... I've... Definitely not as cool as Mechromancer. Calling it now. They might be kind of cool, but that's a high watermark for me personally. So yeah, and they're 
hilarious and it's, it's, it just fills me with joy when I happen to see one. Doll. It's, it reminds me of In Perfect Dark when you could play as the aliens, the greys, in multiplayer, and it was a significant competitive advantage because they're shorter than everybody else, and so you're less likely to get headshots. So, by by classic gamer comparison, the jerk in your gaming group that always picked Odd Job when you were playing Goldeneye together. <laughs> exactly so. I actually brought and this fact, up. Those are basically the same engine by Rare. I thought about this when Pixie initially told me about the story. And uh, the best comment I have for it is, uh, you know, at least there's no dang competitive multiplayer in Mass Effect 3. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the best I got. No competitive multiplayer, but still tryhards. I don't, I, I, let me get to that, because there's something interesting about that with this new DLC. Anyway, um, Turians, they, they've come with both of the tur new Turian classes have propulsion packs, so you've got some different, like, maneuverability there. Yes, oh, is that how they run? Jet packs. That's a pretty <laughs> sweet way to run, not gonna lie. Didn't figure they could waddle that fast. So it, it changes how their melee works. Um, Turians, not Bolas. Oh, yes, I see. Y'all misheard me. <laughs> yeah, I thought we were still on the subject of Volus. Nope. Uh, let's see, the maps have some stuff added to them, these hazards, so you, there can be things like snowstorms, sandstorms, um, which is kind of sweet. hazard maps each week, uh, you get extra experience for playing in those. Uh, well, it definitely rotates up the interest of, you know, it's not the so same map I played on every other time, because this time, well, everything's exploding. Well, there's, like, different strategies you have to take. Like, um, in the Firebase Ghost map, for example, uh, according to the BioWare blog, uh, you have to stay inside to avoid acid rain, which knocks Sweet. out your shields. That sounds uh, like more Firebase of a Tachanka reactor, thing. You can turn on the reactor and that traps, well, whoever inside, and that causes a lot of damage. Sweet. Um, the collectors are an enemy uh, are an enemy well, I don't know, race if you want to call them that uh, they're really hard I would say that, right up there with the reapers um, with that also comes the collector's guns as available weapon unlocks I mentioned Sweet all this last collector week collector laser, love that thing in Mass Effect 2 zap all right, total, totally up for this. Uh, Thank you, Bioware, for reviving my interest in Mass Effect 3. Send, 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 send. I'm not done. There is something else that came as a special surprise announcement today. Or, sorry, two days ago. <laughs> it also makes cookies. Nope. Mm, uh, cookies. Do you all remember Bungie Net? I don't remember Bungie Net, but... <laughs> okay, I do remember Bungie Net, but I try not to. There There's are some now things better a left forgotten. multiplayer tracking site. It's called the N7HQ. And I'm going to link you this for the link dump in the post when this goes online. I try not to remember BungieNet because I didn't get to use it because I don't, I'm not a console gamer. That's like all these statistics. So much stat tracking that I don't have access to. I need to track my stats, you guys. But now I can. Oh, you got one Halo for PC. I did, and I played it a lot. Actually, there were two. I never actually had Halo 2 for the PC, and I get the impression that it was not as good of a port as Halo 1 was, but I played the entirety of Halo 1 for PC on Christmas morning when I got it, and I loved it. Played it start to finish. You know the Nintendo 64 kid? Yeah, Pyro was that guy for Halo 2. Or, sorry, Halo 1. <laughs> yep. I'm in the top 22% no. on the leaderboard. Woo! <laughs> My Ratatat is in the top 90% of N7 agents. 22, strangely. man. 22%. Get it right. Yeah, but Joey's... Ra <laughs> Joey's Ratata is, is in the top 90%. Anyway. Which only <laughs> so means see, he's not in the bottom 10%. So you can see but, how many you know. games you played, where you rank up, uh, how Look, much credits you got. Look, I've got 6 million of these Ratatas. One of them's going to be good. 
Um, there's also those little challenges that allow you to unlock little cosmetic things like banners for, you know, your name in the lobby, stuff like that. Little in-game, not quite achievements. Um, you know, you kill so many things with this weapon or with this class, stuff like that. Um, I'm wildly can, pleased about you've this. You've got little badges on your profile online that you, people can look at to see, you know, if you participated in the weekend operations. Are you helping if there's out one your thing team? I like, it's websites that record statistics. Also video games. And this is both. Pyro's going to spend hours on this website just, like, figuring out uh, Pixie's analytics. <laughs> just doing math. Doing, hey, you, finding. Can, you can see your achievements from the, from the games. Why am I picturing, like, Farmville levels of, of obsession? Dude, dude, check my Chivos. Please. I need someone to look at these. <laughs> But I hope this is as well maintained as BungieNet was. It seems that Bioware's been a bit busy this week, because that's not the only release by them. Yeah, and segue. Star Wars The Old Republic got its 1.4 update, which includes, and this is a feature I am unduly excited about, stateful emotions for your characters. You can put your character into a joyful mood, or an angry mood, or whatever other moods they have scripted in there, and this will reflect in your character's facial expression. And it will just stay that way until you change it. Until you're in a cutscene. And I don't believe it is... yeah, it doesn't affect cutscenes. And it's not a static mask, it is actually a set of facial animations. So, your character will just walk around scowling at things, and snickering, and being all nerf nerf. I, I just want my Sith to always be walking around laughing, like regardless of everything that's else that's going on. Pretty interesting. Just... I knew about a lot of this ahead of time because I tend to read these things more frequently. He just finds everything super hilarious. He just laughs in the middle of a fight. The other thing that I saw in the email is that they're telling me to resubscribe now so that I will get my subscriber bonus of cartel coins. So apparently it's still not free to play. I've kind of been out of the loop for a little while. Yeah, I kind of expected that to have gone through by now. Yeah, at the launch of the free-to-play option this fall, it says. But they've been saying this fall, this fall, this fall. Guys, it's fall now. It's We're already almost halfway through October. I know it's still like 90 degrees at 5 p.m. in Las Cruces, but it's it's fall. But it is scarf weather where we are. <laughs> yeah, there, there's only like eight and a half weeks left in the semester. Uh, I've got nine weeks. I have 67 days, and I've been keeping an active ticker. He's been counting all of them. I actually have received some insight that makes me think the Old Republic will do pretty well when it goes free-to-play, because I have had fully three people on the streets ask me if I am going to get into the Old Republic when it goes free-to-play. To which I respond, hey, I was in when it was subscription. Right, I've already got a level 50, sucker. <laughs> exactly that. But the question indicates that people will probably try and play it once they don't have to pay for it. No, I, I genuinely think the older public will become popular again as soon as it steps down to free-to-play. Like, I do not doubt that for a second. Well, that is quite likely. Because Guild Wars 2 is actually doing very, very well at the moment. Because people are like, what, you mean I don't have to pay every month for this? Great, I'm down for that in a heartbeat. Uh huh. Judging by the number of special weapons in Mass Effect 3 and the number of skins I've seen on League of Legends, once people are playing a game, they're more than willing to drop money on it. Are you kidding? Just those things? Play a game of uh, Team Fortress 2 and count the hats. Th that is very true. Hats in Team Fortress 2 hats are just based an enormous economy. source of revenue for Valve. They are a significant source of revenue for the company that runs Steam. So, well, that's a lot of money. <laughs> Hats! <laughs> Man, whoever came up with that idea must be rolling in it. The official statement from Valve is sort of, we do not understand why people keep buying hats. We don't, like, we get, don't it. get it. We don't care but... to get it, we just like it. 
As long as you people love hats so much, we'll keep making them, I guess. But believe us, we have no insight into this process. Yep. So maybe this will do financially well for EA and BioWare. And maybe that will make the doctors feel a little bit better about all the hard work they put in. We miss you guys. Yeah, did they solely leave just because of the disappointment over uh, over the older public? I mean, that game wasn't a failure. Dr. Greg indicated in his resignation letter that he had not seen his family in a long time, and that this particular project had taken him away from his family for longer than he wanted, and so he was going to spend more time with them. I see. Well, best wishes to them What in whatever pursuit they may be uh, undertaking. All right, what else we got? Do we want to talk about the League of Legends finals and that debacle? I know nothing about this, so you can go right ahead. Okay, so the League of Legends playoffs, uh, day three was Wait, supposed to be held I last Saturday. I remember Saturday. something about that, where they had to move them, but I don't recall why. They had to call them off because they were uh, having constant disconnections, and rumor has it they were being hit by, like, uh, denial-of-service attacks. That would explain why when we were watching... You were listed as the only person, and also the stream was hiccuping something fierce. Right, like, they were having genuine bad times trying to run these events. And we witnessed that this firsthand. Is, this is dark cynicism on my part, but in light of the uh, sort of gambling malfeasance um, undertaken by Team Dignitas, I wonder if this is more malfeasance by the teams involved? perhaps trying to minimize the popularity of competitors or something? Uh, I wouldn't. Who, I wouldn't go who that far. would be DDoSing Riot streams? Why would they do that? Well, it wasn't the streams that were getting interrupted. It That's was the actual... pure speculation. It, it, oh, it, it is wild speculation yeah, and totally that, unfounded, no, and I don't believe it, it myself. It wasn't the streams that were getting interrupted. It was the actual event. Like... When Riot hosts League of Legends tournaments, they're not hosting, uh, they're not, like, doing LAN play and then broadcasting it. They're actually still running the games off of their servers. They just have the players in one location. I know it doesn't make sense at all. The... the I guess the reason that would be is simply because it is technically difficult to develop a new architecture for your program. Right. But at the same time, I'm really disappointed that the that they don't have a dedicated server system behind the scene, simply because I hate latency, like, with a passion. Like, come on, if, if you're really playing at this high of a level, then you need to do a minimum latency setup, and that means having the server in the same building as the players. So yeah, at after multiple instances of players disconnecting, being unable to connect, getting massive lag spikes, they just called it. Uh, so day three has been, uh, as quoted by Riot, postponed to be broadcast from a secure location. <laughs> it's going to be an underground bunker? Basically. Uh, and That's they will crazy. live stream it out to people. But yeah, I, I'm sorry, but with a $2 million prize on the line, you need extra security. Right. J just say uh, That kind of money is what inspires my like, cynicism and wild speculation and slander. <laughs> I'm just... Not that, not that I... I just had a minor I didn't name anybody that... in particular that might have been doing that. I was just saying... Dignitas did the thing prior, so maybe some team is involved in this. Well, the other uh, day I got on League and was like, what the? Kha'Zix is still new? I haven't had a new champ in, like, four weeks? I'm getting twitchy. <laughs> By which he means he's going to play the, the rat man who, ha who builds attack speed and does poison damage. Twitch! <laughs> Who's been strangely popular in games lately? I've played against a number of Twitches. Maybe it's just because everybody else is getting twitchy from the lack of new champions. Need new champs. It, it's weird genuinely thinking that 
a champ that's four weeks old is still the newest dude. Like, I'm, I'm yeah. not used to this. But so, still, this news... I will give credit to Riot that the recent batch of champs they've released have all been intriguing and unique. Like, running back, Kha'Zix is cool because he's a jungler that is aggressive with his uh, AD moves and still uses mana. Rengar has his really cool hunt mechanic and gives you that, like, jungle predator fantasy. Um, Syndra is basically Orianna 2.0, but has unique mechanics all uh, to her own and has a cool personality. They've been really spot on with their champs lately. There, there hasn't been one that came out that I'm like, oh, another bruiser or another mage. It's nice to see some variety, for sure. Right? So, this is a bit of an old event, but I'd like to mention it in passing. Uh, Resident Evil 6 came out at the beginning of the month. And has been to, getting panned. To deafening criticism. Everybody hates this game, effectively. Yeah, um, I have not read a positive review of this thing yet. And it's kind of so, sad, to be honest. Yeah, I, I would have hoped that it was good. I played um, a fair amount of Resident Evil 4 and 5 on consoles in a friend's dorm room um, over the course of basically my college career. And I wasn't a huge fan of them, but I, I enjoyed them when I was playing them, certainly. And to that end, I would like the next game in the franchise to also be enjoyable to play. It does not seem that that is the case. No, it genuinely feels like Resident Evil 6 wanted to be a big-time action movie, but I hate to tell them, but Resident Evil, you've already got action movies under your belt, and I'm not talking about the uh, Paul W. Mila Jovovich movies. Yeah, I'm not talking about those. There is an entire series of animated Resident Evil films that basically do the job of Resident Evil 6. Like, Resident Evil Degeneration, it was a bad movie, but... It was Resident Evil. It felt like it. I, I have a bit of a dark confession, which is that I kind of have really enjoyed the Mila Jovovich Resident Evil movies. And I'm not sure that anybody could accept me or love me now that I've admitted that. That's but... on the internet forever. In fact, we have to destroy you now. It's part of the policies. <laughs> what, one of my favorite scenes is that in the third one... There is a scene where the Alice character comes upon a clone of herself, and I'm like, this makes perfect sense. It's two-player mode. <laughs> and then there's thousands of Alices, and they kill everything. Everything forever. Yep. They also then kill so, good taste, and the chance that this franchise would have been good. Those movies are terrible, but they have decent uh, action choreography in them. And if they abuse the lore of the franchise, that's kind of no skin off my back right. because let's just, I wasn't an aficionado. Well, let's just to say that with. the Resident Evil plotline to begin with, not exactly known for uh, for aces. Right, but retcons and you know inconsistencies are already commonplace in the mainline franchise. Wesker so. is now the ultimate super soldier. Wasn't he just the guy that got stabbed in the chest for being a backstabbing jerk at the end of the first game? Yeah, but he was popular, so he came back. And then became, like, a crazy monster. Yeah, I don't think you can just add that later. I think you have to always have that. Because... <laughs> the Resident Evil team says no. Tyrant you could do that whenever you want. shoved a claw through his chest in the first game, and then he got blown up in a nuclear explosion. You know, the one that leveled the mansion... They say that's the only way to be sure. Er, apparently it wasn't enough to be sure. No, apparently the only way you actually be sure, according to Resident Evil, until they bring him back, is you throw him into an active volcano and then decapitate him using twin rocket launchers. That's the way you be sure. That said, this is Capcom, so, you know, Resident Evil 7, Wesker's back? I, I'm not betting money against it. No, apparently it. this time for 6 we have Son of Wesker. Right. And that's like, I hear that that is mentioned, like, once 
in the game, and it is not a plot point, and there is no build up to it or denouement from it. I, I think but an important like, question can get asked: Hey, dude, when did Wesker find time to reproduce, and with who or what? <laughs> Those are valid questions. One that Resident Evil Six does not answer. Does not bother. So, Sen, I hear that you're old enough of a man that you remember the XCOM games. Nope. <laughs> okay, he's changing his story, folks. I He's old. I have never once played an XCOM game. I had heard of them as that ridiculously hard franchise that you can never win. I I am old enough to remember Crusader No Remorse being a new game. I got very excited about that because it's like, oh my god, live actors and animations, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, I remember that. I suppose I have no real ground to talk in this situation because I have very fond memories in my childhood of playing Wing Commander Privateer. Yeah! Which is a game that came out in 1992 when I was two years old, which I probably did not play it at that age. I played it later. But XCOM, the original, came out in 1996. And so if I could play Privateer, I could have played XCOM. Yes, I... But I didn't. I have never played XCOM. That said, looking at XCOM Enemy Unknown, which came out this last week, I'd give it a shot if it wasn't That's... full price. <laughs> and yes, that is... I have a very, very short list of games that I'm willing to purchase for full price, and the only ones in the foreseeable future are Assassin's Creed 3 at the end of October, or maybe it, it, if things go terribly wrong for me, the end of November because Ubisoft kind of has a problem with releasing PC games simultaneously with their console counterparts. Right. But Assassin's Creed 3 and SimCity next year. And those are the two games that I'm willing to pay $60 for. I could see myself throwing down for Dishonored at full price because it's basically like, hey buddy, Let's take two of your favorite games ever and combine them. Yeah, when I read Deus Ex in descriptions of that game, that certainly perked my ears right. up. Let, let's take and combine Deus Ex and Thief, the Dark Project. And I'm like, oh, I need a change of pants. <laughs> it's like, Well, you've sold me on the concept. Really? You're going to combine those two on me? Oh, I'll get my wallet. <laughs> I, I th you have not sold me on the concept for sixty dollars. Given the caveat that I can guaranteed uh, wait until the Christmas sale and get it for thirty to forty. I know. I'm gonna wait. That and I've got way too much that I'm playing right now, and I technically have like ninety pages worth of papers that I have to write before the end of the semester. <laughs> well, yeah, that too. I have more games in my Steam list than I could possibly play in the next two years if nothing else came out, but let's ignore those little details and just hoard like hoarders. Yeah. Okay. But digital hoarders, so it doesn't ruin your life. Uh, you know what else came out this week? What's that? Uh, Sunday. Let's see, that would be October 7th. Pokemon Black and Pokemon White 2 were released ah. because... Nintendo does things on Sundays, unlike everyone else. Uh, so I've picked up a copy of that. I have not had a chance to play it yet, because when I went to do so today, my DS was dead. So 3DS specifically. I hear there's not terribly much to do with a 3DS. Uh, no, it's Indeed, still an expensive I hear that way. Pokemon Black and White 2 are not exclusive to the 3DS, and I'm a little disappointed by that. Nope, they certainly aren't. In fact, I'm holding the box right now. It just says Nintendo DS on it. And not even, not even an eye. It doesn't even need cameras. Can, can I do an idiotic news story to uh, compliment this one? Sure. So, in their usual fashion, PETA felt the need to get in with the Pokemon Black and White 2 release and have released their own version of Pokemon cards. One that actually has Ash Ketchum dressed as a pimp. 
and has like okay. battered and bruised versions of the Pokemon uh, that if you complete their little like game that they've got actually has downloadable printable versions of their cards so thank you PETA thank you for always providing something hilarious along with your stupid backwards messages Thank you, PETA, for making people who support animal rights look bad by you are really stupid. <laughs> Let me explain to you a concept that fiction and reality are separate things. Uh, I'm sorry, one of my favorite wallpapers that I've got is still the cooking mama, mama kills animals picture with, like, the demonic-eyed mama holding a dead chicken in one hand and a knife in the other. At least that, like, has Enjoying a connection. Your voice is a little disconcerting. I'm sorry, I love these ads. I love when PETA does this. They're like, you're taking this game way too seriously, PETA. Yeah, Knock in a it way, off. it you're is kind of amazing silly. how, like, crazy these PETA marketers have to be to think that they're doing a good thing for themselves. Like, this but... is the same thing they did with the Mario wearing the bloody Tanuki suit, because apparently that's fur. Right, and Super Meat Boy yeah. having the Super Tofu, Super Boy. Tofu Boy. Like, Peter, you understand these are fiction, correct? They're like, like real animals that you could be helping by euthanizing, you jerks. The protestation about Cooking Mama, at least in that circumstance... That has something to do with, with an life. actual behavior that humans do in real life. With Super Meat Boy, it's like this is nonsense. It's, it's this it's is for not all those like people who buy like tons of meatloaf and roll around in them to emulate and throw them, them into know. walls to make red smears. I know I played Super Meat Boy this weekend, and it was totally being cruel to animals. Oh wait, there's no animals in it. So. Another game that we all have copies of and have not had a chance to play it yet is Torchlight, Torchlight 2. 2. I disagree. I played 15 minutes of it on uh, on Saturday morning. And I'm going to have to interrupt Sen here because we have to take a break. But at the top of the hour, we'll hear more about Torchlight 2 on Nerd Talk. And we're back with more on Torchlight 2 here on Nerd Talk. Right now, Pyro. <laughs> well... Yes, I am actually actively playing it as I'm doing... No, I'm not. I mean, it is open, but I, I tend to have wildly skewed Steam stats because I leave things open. And then it's like, yeah, I have played 8 billion hours of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. I do always well, see you logged into that. Right. And you see me logged into it, but I'm not actually playing it. I'm doing homework, and it is open. There's a mechanic in the game where uh, you accrue money by waiting, and also you have your quote, brothers, or in my case, sisters, um, who are your other assassins who are out doing missions while you play it. And so, it is a thing that you open and you touch for, like, two minutes, and then you walk away from it for 30, and it just does its thing in the background. But I have actually played, like, two hours of Torchlight 2, enough to know that I think I enjoy it more than Diablo 3. I'm not going which to I played. argue that point. As someone who has uh, played Diablo to Hell Mode, it is a more entertaining game. The thing that kind of disappointed me about the first Torchlight that prevented me from enjoying it the way I enjoyed the Diablo 2 is that it felt like it was lacking in mechanics. Like, there simply were not enough mechanics to keep me interested. So, kind of like Diablo 1? <laughs> right. And so I was very pleased when in, like, the first 15 minutes of playing Torchlight 2, you run into an enemy type where there is a large semi-boss monster who resurrects the corpses of the smaller minion monsters who are around it. So you have to choose who you are targeting. And so it's like, it is a thing like that that makes the game more interesting. Instead of just hacking at everything blindly, you have to choose your targets. And then it'll be like there will be elemental associations with enemies, and you can quaff potions that give you resistances to that element in order to, say, fight a particular boss of that type. Um, the one thing I am doing, and I 
almost never play games on higher difficulty settings than the default, but Tycho from Penny Arcade strongly recommended that you play the game on Veteran if you have ever played any video game before. And I, from my time with Veteran Mode, I have the feeling that he is correct about that. Um, if you, like, even, you don't have to be good at them, but if you have knowledge of the idea of trying to fight enemies one by one so that there's less damage being done to you at a time and then you can go heal, if you understand concepts like that, then you need to play on Veteran in order to have the best experience with Torchlight 2 yeah, and not I, Normal. I definitely fired it up on Normal and played for the first 15 minutes and I'm like, my Outlander is just shooting everything in the face and I haven't actually been touched by an enemy yet. And, uh, two things. There is a ramp to the difficulty of the game. Um, like, the first hour is kind of trivial, even on Veteran, and it gets a little more difficult, but, um, I think the second hour remains trivial on Normal. Right, because right now it's literally just the Outlander sees an enemy, the Outlander approaches the enemy, fires dual pistols, and the enemy's face explodes. But it is pretty fun when you actually have to think of, okay, there are a lot of enemies in that area over there, and so I'm going to run in, make them all mad at me, and run away, well, and shoot. some of them are going to lose interest, but, like, two or three are going to stick with me. And so I will fight the small group of them, and then go back, and there are less. Yep. Uh, and there are a few mechanics I need to point out that hugely supplant um, my experience with Diablo 3, which is that the overworld map and your um, percentage of it that is filled in is persistent. If you explore a section of the map, then that section of the map will remain there with your character forever, and it will remain on your map forever. And this means a lot to me because the first thing I have done in every section I have gone to is run around the entire map, filling in my view of it, and then just kiting this enormous ball of monsters behind me. And then once the whole map is full, I'll just stop running, and then I'll be annihilated instantly. And then I will choose the resurrection option, which is go back to town and lose no gold and no experience. And then I will venture out again, and I'll have a full map. Yeah, And I'll be like, hey, so some, I enjoyed that process. Something I'm noticing about Blizzard's core players versus, I forget who makes Torchlight, uh, well, any other game company, really. Blizzard's players are incredibly self-destructive in that they want... They're, they're masochists. They want to be punished for failing. Like, there has to be some kind of pu uh, dire punishment for, for dying. Like, this is why we invented hardcore mode for Diablo. Like, please punish me for doing badly. I don't want that when I'm playing games. Like, I'm happy with Borderlands that... If I die, I lose this resource that I don't really use. It, it lets me right. know that it's, I'm, it's bad that I died, but I'm not punished for doing it. Like, I'm perfectly and irrespective fine with Torchlight just letting me get off with, yeah, you can go back to town if you want, or you can just respawn. And the symptom of choosing the go back to town option is that it spends a reasonable amount of your time because you have to travel back out to where you were, and you have the choice of spending money or experience to um, resurrect uh, closer, uh, either at the start of the dungeon you are in, or right exactly where you are, um, for a much higher cost. Right. And so, th that is interesting that you have those three choices, but... I care more than about that, about the fact that I am making progress when I am playing Torchlight 2, because I feel like in Diablo 3, if I go out and I explore an area, and then I quit and I come back, then my whole previous session was wasted because I didn't accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. But I can pop on Torchlight for five minutes, explore a zone, and then log off, and then log back on later, and I will have my map filled in. And it's like, oh! I, my time meant something. There's progression. Yep, my time has not been wasted. <laughs> Even more than that, on the overworld, there are a finite number of monsters, and if you clear a zone, then that zone will remain mostly clear. Like, maybe one or two minor monsters will be wandering around it, but, like, in the overworld, 
you will clear a zone, and it will be done. That is not true of dungeons, and dungeons have both random maps and um, endlessly respawning enemies when you close your session and come back. So you get the best of both worlds, because you, you have the persistence of the overworld, but each individual dungeon has the random maps and the endless enemies. And so I like that compromise much better than there's no persistence to anything. Sounds legit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting a chance to, you know, play it when I have two set bare seconds of any free time ever. <laughs> that is a extremely precious resource. Right? Yeah. Hey. This semester has been brutal. <laughs> has been, still is. These are just concepts. It's just Will continue wrong. to be for the next 67 days. Yep. So, yeah. Is that, uh, that good for this section of the show, or do we want to keep going? Well, do you have anything else? I'm out. I'm out. All right. Um, next week, what are we talking about? Are we gonna? Uh, I need to put probably play some Pokemon since I can probably manage that. Since I I'm can take see that how with my, me. I'm gonna see how my time goes, and I would love to play some Dishonored, but it's dude, all gonna be. Dude, we need to get on Mass Effect. You, me, multiplayer. I'll do some multiplayer with you. Um, I also want to review Dead or Alive Five. Like, That's interesting, but go for it. As as far as fighting games go, I feel that Dead or Alive has the best mechanics of any fighting game franchise. The problem is it's also coded in the crap that everyone's actually talking about. And I think that's kind of sad. Yeah, I feel like the Dead or Alive franchise does itself a significant disservice by... The only press coverage is about the uh, boob physics. Yes. And it's like, well, that means we cannot take you seriously in terms of narrative. And it's because unfortunate we're too... because the system is so awesome. It's got this wonderful counter system. Every character plays fundamentally differently. They all have unique combos. They're all unique characters. But all we ever focus on is jiggle physics and how much clothing the characters aren't wearing. And to be fair, in the public eye, that is kind of all the developers ever focus on, too. And that is an even bigger shame. Yeah. And, and that's so. why my tournament fighting game of choice is Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Well, let's take the high ground as press on this and simply condemn this in one sentence and then actually concern ourselves with the rest of the game because right. enough other people have talked about the jiggle physics. Right. So that will be next week, maybe. Possibly. Depends. I have burning questions about the multiplayer of Torchlight 2. We haven't had a chance to do any of that. But that is at least something I, I want to touch on. I should probably start by asking, what character are you playing, Pyro? I am playing as an engineer. Okay. Isn't that a melee class? Um, well, the way my character is built, and there are, of course, three skill trees, as there just have to be in any game, apparently, right. is for strict durability. And so, I just, I just stand there and survive. And um, I have a move <laughs> called like Shield life. Bash. That does damage proportional to my armor. <laughs> Much like life. Thank you, Pixie. I was like, life, life. You stand life there is and you all live. about doing damage proportional to your armor values. In the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sam. And I'm Pyrosim. And we'll catch you at the top of the hour on Nerd Talk. Okay, so that's a little bit of a lie in that it isn't quite the top of the hour, but hey, we got a late start today. Pyro, are you here? I am here. All right, so you? I'm Pixie, as I've mentioned um, about two seconds ago on our uh, <laughs> on our pre-recorded portion of the podcast. I very nearly just said that I was Sen, <laughs> because that's the order it goes in, and so I, if I'm saying the second thing, I must be saying I'm Sen, <laughs> but I'm actually Pyrosim. Funny how that works out. Gosh, the the difference in mic quality, like going from one format to the other is insane, isn't it? 
It is very crazy. Although I got a bit of a gentle start on it because for the latter half of the show, I was listening to myself over the phone connection because I was calling into the radio and listening to the show over my phone. So it's like, yeah, I sounded bad before, and now I still sound bad. (laughs) All right. Well, the unfortunate truth of it is that I still haven't had a chance to play Pokemon because, well, super busy college student. What do you want? Um, I do have my strategy guide here because I'm one of the dorks who buys the strategy guides and looks at the pretty pictures. Mm, and they come with posters. Um, so I've been going I really that. like strategy guides. I, they are the highest margin item at GameStop, and you might have a little experience with it. That's what they want to sell the most of in order, well, that and used games to make their money. And they've, they've got... kind of fallen off in quality ever since gamefaqs.com has thoroughly supplanted them in terms of if you just want a pure walkthrough description of how to accomplish something in a game but I love some of the artisan and craftsmanship that goes into real nicely produced professional strategy guides I would even call the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind strategy guide the Elder Scrolls Prophecies amongst my favorite books because a lot of about that game is that there's little background narrative and there will be quote quests that consist of no action that needs to be taken by the player but there will just be sort of images painted by oh there's this campsite with this food out and these bones sitting here and then oh there's this bear and the other half of these boat this skeleton there's like a head and a torso at this campsite, and this bear has like a pair of legs as loot on its corpse. Uh, the strategy guy is like, hey, hey, look at this. So is the um, Pokemon strategy guide lovingly produced? Uh, it's very colorful and lots of pictures, and yeah, I, I, I tend to be a fan of these because it also kind of allows for the okay well if you're just going for the main story progression this is kind of the linear way to do it but it also factors in a bit that not everybody goes straight for that linear approach so i like that it's got like kind of a suggested route that you should take to maximize your um i guess output but uh but it also ignores like the, there's the the quick um the quick rundown of here's how we would suggest you do this and here's how the story is going to be laid out so these are going to be the plot specific events and where they are but here's also just maps and numbers and things like that and just in general tips for stuff not that i need them because you know it's i've been playing this for (sighs) let's see how many years has this franchise been around I think it came out in, like, 95, 97. Pixie knows what types a ghost type is weak against. She doesn't need a guide to tell her that. Indeed. Anyway. Or, like, how to make an HM mule. I mean, that's not really a thing that I need. But some things are just, I like, there are certain things that I don't bother memorizing, like the different nature. There's some stuff from the newer generation games, like, you know, things like the personality natures and how those affect stats and underneath there has under the... have, there have been more mechanics added to the game become a very long list of things to memorize if and you really want to be hardcore so i and i was never very super competitive about it anyway i was more of the like collector approach it's pokemon look at the cute little animals look at their little faces um, so I, I was more along the gotta catch them all rather than the be the very best approach. So, for example, it's not hard to be the very best in the Pokemon universe because most of the other trainers don't even the, have well, mastery the of the idea you should be carrying around six Pokemon. Like, and not all, and not six of the same Pokemon. But, right. <laughs> I, I have a full library of different types of Pokemon. I am like the ultimate master. This is just strategy jitsu. However, um, the P- P- real players, those are hard. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So, 
and those tournaments are kind of nuts and there's a whole bunch of like i mean at the surface at the very at the very surface level pokemon is cute fuzzy animals meets rock paper scissors under the hood though there's a whole mess of numbers games going on there a whole lot of math I mean, and stats and stuff I just can't be bothered even with. Even at the, the rock paper scissors levels, there's like 40 different configurations you'd have to be able to shape your hand into. You have to be throwing gang signs in order to correspond hand positions to all the different Pokemon types. Speaking of which, I think there's a um, if I if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure there's a um, download event going on this week, or I I know it's this week. But it might be continuing for the next couple weeks. I'm not 100% on that. Um, there's going to be another Pokemon available for download at GameStops. You bring in your copy of the game and download it onto your DS from there. Uh, the same way they gave away Victini and like that level 5 Mew and, you know, in, in previous DS releases. So, Exciting. another one of those, those with this new release. Or just very hard to get. Otherwise. They are exclusive. You cannot uh, get the, these Pokemon in game. It's you got them via download or not at all. Better get to a GameStop then. Yep. So I'm going to have to do that. I'm a little bit depressed that I haven't even had a chance to play a portable DS title. But that is the state of my schedule currently. Um, so this is the first time that we've had a direct sequel to a Pokemon game ever. I feel like, yeah, this is like Final Fantasy X-2. It's like super late in the generation, and we're switching up the formula. Is there a narrative continuity between them? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, it mentions in the very beginning here, it gives you a summary of what happened in the last game. And the characters look a little bit older. You start in a different town. And I... But what, what throws me off a little bit... Is that, okay, so you had these extra couple characters. You've got the rival that you've always had. But then there's these two, like, friend characters that you started out with. And y'all got your Pokemon together. And so you've got Bianca, who takes the Pokemon that's weak against yours. And then you've got uh, Sharon, who takes the Pokemon that's strong against yours. And then there's a side rival character here in this game. The way that comes into play is that Sharon now is the first gym leader that you run into. Whoa. She got good at Pokemon pretty Key. quick. It's spelled C-H-E-R-E-N. Ah. Does he have two gold coins on his eyes? No. He, he looks a little bit hipster, I'm not going to lie. but Seems all right. Apparently, it it's possible to become a gym leader very quickly. Well, I mean, I don't know what all goes into that, actually. Okay, so I am attempting to find a list of the Pokemon that are used in that first gym. Ah, oh, well, this is annoying. All they did was, you know take the character's name and character model it looks like he doesn't actually have a comprehensive set of pokemon to go up against in your first battle so that's oh. a little bit disappointing this he's just got like a patch rat and a little pup both of which are normal types that seems very unusual since the gyms are typically characterized by their type yeah and this one's a normal type oh huh. Has there ever been a normal type? Yep, gym in before? the last game. Ah. In black, in black and white. So well, there you black go. and white two follows that same you. formula there, but it's it's weird that they just you know switched who the actual gym leader is without having him take a. I don't know. It seems weird to me because Sharon seemed the more competent um, rival of yours, and. For him to go down to, I only have two Pokemon, and they're both the same type. That seems a little dumb to me. It does seem dumb, but I can accept a fair amount of dumbness in the Pokemon universe. Because, well, A, 
the player character is a 10 year old and is clearly amongst like the top five most intelligent people in the I universe. think they're slightly older in these games now oh cool so I think we're looking at like maybe early teens um, sure so Bianca is now Professor Juniper's assistant in this game and you are playing as a separate character from the first game so you're not continuing to play as the same person which i th- which w- when i heard that this th- that this was going to be a sequel was where i got confused because i was like how are you going to do that because well you can't be the same person because you won't have all of your pokemon and stuff and everything so apparently that's it where they're just borrowing these other characters and stuff just pull a metroid where like whoops i lost all of my skills and pokemon and equipment no and actually items. it's it's all these other people who happen to know that other character that you were playing as uh, before like bianca's like oh yeah i was friends with that person but you were not them is there any explanation for the conspiracy that has resulted in all scientists being named after trees or is that just a coincidence. I think that's just a theme they do, like how um, for a long time all the cities were named after colors. Uh Uh-huh. I like to think that these are not the original names of the professors, and that when they go to university, it's like being a ninja, and you take your your name when you graduate, your true name, instead of your old name. They They have to pick a tree to name themselves after. Except then you've got relatives that have the same name. And also, I think they're given first names here. Let me double check that. Oop, too far ahead. Because, yeah, I'm looking at Professors Aria Juniper and Cedric Juniper. So, that they're not... They, those are actual family names. I see. Hmm. So, and your conspiracy theory to... doesn't hold water here. Dang it. Are all police officers still Officer Jenny? And all nurses Nurse Joy? Um, well, those don't have names in the games and never have. And also, I don't recall I seeing feel like actual there, you did in the uh, games. do battles against Officer Jennies in earlier generations. They yeah. were trainers. But I don't I don't recall encountering in the DS series named um the the nurses didn't have names and i mean feel free to correct me if i'm wrong here but my memory is failing me if that is the case and actually that's part of the problem is the police are generally not around otherwise why would they be leaving a child to solve all these problems yep it seems like the entirety of society has some fundamental failing that you need a teenager to fix everything Up to and including the fact that the it, this is not this probably is not in a modern game, but a gym that has a shrubbery blocking its entrance, and it's like, well, we adults cannot do any gardening, and thereby make it possible to get into this building by cutting down the shrubbery. We need a child to do it for us. So come on, adults. Grow some responsibility. So yeah, there's just little little nods to the last game like that. Um, as far as the narrative, honestly, the narrative has never been super strong in Pokemon. I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. Of course not. But the pretty pictures have always been very strong. It's It's about the mechanics. It's about what's under the hood, honestly. And it does that. So, what's your starter? Like I said, I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but I generally pick the fire types, so probably Tepig. Especially since fire types are difficult to come across in the wild, whereas water, well, I mean, tripping over water and grass types. Uh Uh-huh. The only problem with that is that Tepig eventually evolves to have a second type. And dual typing, to me, is very tricky, you really need to find a good combination. Otherwise, all you're doing is adding on more weaknesses. Like, when Charizard was classified as a combo fire flying type, 
Charizard was dead to me. That's it. Yeah, that's no good. That's Charmeleon. If you want to be way. fire dragon type, well, maybe that's all right. But fire flying? Nah. It, that just gives you all happen. kinds of added vulnerability. And uh, don't need that. So, yeah, the fire fighting combo is... An, and as it is, I you generally wait to evolve my Pokemon until they have the exact move set that I want and then give them the stat bonus. But in this case, I may not evolve it at all because, well, I don't I don't want that extra typing because I don't want the extra weaknesses. Uh huh. You know exactly where you stand when you only have one type. Yep. So, if you, what is the level cap for a Pokemon? Is it one hundred or ninety nine? Something like that. I've never actually gotten a Pokemon to level cap because, you know, a new game has always come out before I've managed to play that far. Yeah, the experience ramp means that you need to grind for a long time to level up at higher levels. Yeah, and I generally don't bother doing that. I was, I've been, I got pretty close th thanks to the Pokewalker uh. um, back in Heart Gold and Soul Silver release, but of course, new games have come out and the Pokewalker isn't compatible with those. Which still breaks my heart. The Pokewalker is a great device, and it's like it feels like it would be very easy for Nintendo to support it for the people who already own it, at least with new software. But they chose not to. The reason I ask about the level cap is I would feel totally comfortable to not level up a Pokemon or to not evolve a Pokemon up to two levels before level cap. But if I got locked out forever, I would feel really bad about that because I don't like making permanent decisions. But if it takes just preposterously long to reach level cap, then that wouldn't be a concern. Yeah, no, it, and it does take preposterously long. Such that I've never actually managed to do that, so I don't really have a problem. And as I've said, I don't really play it competitively, so that's not been a thing that I needed to do. Right. So, I, I saw an image on Reddit the other day about somebody getting sad about deleting their Pokemon save to start over. Mm -hmm. And that makes me want to ask about save slots. Are there, like, three of them, or just one of them? There has always, in the history of Pokemon, only been one. Ever. That seems like a serious deficiency. I, they, could, they could improve upon that. Especially it is, you when save, they, and when you save, you overwrite your old slot, and if you want to create a new game, you are erasing everything that you had. That sucks. They should add save slots. <laughs> Indeed, they should add um, cloud saves, because... This brand um, franchise has been out for l more than a decade. I think that, you know, if... Well, it, it might be a holdover from when there used to be technical limitations that said that you couldn't, but... At this right. point, it's kind of part of the... Part of the branding, so to speak, uh -huh. is that, you know, it is so much work. Right. And I feel like what that would mean for me if I owned a 3DS would be that well, I would Well, this is just a DS Pokemon. title. You can just play it on a DS because this is not sure. a 3DS title. But since the price drop, I think I would never buy a older hardware than I is available because surely eventually there will be 3ds software i mean i know there's not much of it right now but it's gonna happen right right guys but, you're not yeah. the one who dropped the money to buy one at uh on launch day it is um rather unfortunate but yeah it, it doesn't appear to be going anywhere and until some titles come out that are you know exclusive and utilize the, the hardware it's not going to happen. Yeah. And then you get trapped into this vicious cycle where nobody develops for the for the hardware because nobody has the hardware and nobody's buying the hardware because there aren't any there, there isn't any software for it. 
and you don't even have things like you don't even have things like the pc modding community which is what helped the connect out so much yeah i bet you feel double early adopter burned because i know you really liked your dsi xl and have you seen the 3ds xl and it's like, well, I would trade up for this to get, you know, that giant screen that I loved so much back, but... I can't justify it. I cannot it justify it because there's no bloody software for it. My 3DS has sat basically untouched since... I want to say... Yeah, since Legend of Zelda. That's since the time. since the three DS Ocarina of Time port. That was the last time that I played my three DS. I was looking forward to the three DS um Animal Crossing, but that's been getting pushed that, that that release has been getting delayed for more than a year now. Yeah, that's hard. Now we're we still don't have a concrete release really date. It is sometime in the first or possibly second quarter of twenty thirteen. There may or may not eventually be an Animal Crossing game for the 3DS. <laughs> it's basically where I'm at. The state of what we know. It's basically where I'm at right now. So, one thing that I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about Torchlight that I forgot was that I was interested in firing up the mod tools, but then it turns out they're not actually available yet. They're supposed to come out a few weeks after launch, but do it is currently a few weeks after launch. Uh, let's see, it came out September 20th, so it is fully a month after launch and they're not out yet. Nobody else really seems to be concerned, and I'm sure the mod tools will be out soon, but I was hoping to bypassed Pixie's early adopter problem by being a late adopter, but I didn't do my research and I didn't adopt late enough for all of my features to be there when I bought in. Dang it. So, if you had traded in your uh, 3DS for a 3DS XL, you would probably be paying more than if you had gotten a 3DS XL out of the gate, right? Oh, well, it's hard to say. I mean, there's a lot of places will give you, like, bonus credit for trading in towards something else. But... Well, that's cool. Okay, well, I guess in that, that would answer my question with, no, it could be a good deal, except for the fact that the, the 3DS was so expensive out of the gate, and then they had the $40 price drop when that launched the ambassador program so that probably means it was super expensive just because the original 3ds was launched at such a high price do you know anybody who's talking about mark of the ninja no i don't actually do this is going around the press pretty thoroughly it is an xbox live uh Oh, an Xbox Live Arcade title? That would be why. Yeah. Um, it's not... I guess it is XBLA, yeah. You're right. There's a couple of different stores that can be involved in Xbox. I get them confused sometimes. But the press really likes it. And I would try it out if I knew anybody else who was playing it personally. Mm-hmm. It's going to be coming to the PC soon, but it's not available yet. Yeah, I don't know. So, been hitting a bit of a roadblock here. So, hopefully I'm going to well, I'm going to buckle down and actually get my hands on it and be able to compare more accurately the features from last game with this Pokémon title. Um, I picked up Black 2, so I should by next week's show be able to turn up something. So, I feel like if there was really compelling multiplayer, then I that would sell me enough that I would get a 3DS and I would get a 3DS on the prospect of future software and a copy of Pokemon Black or White 2 that 
I don't feel like there's compelling enough multiplayer. Oh, there's not multiplayer in the specific way that you want it. Right. Which is like, I mean, well, you and I have had this conversation off the air several times, but I'm sure we should probably explain it for the benefit of our podcast listeners. Ideally, I would like to be walking around with my character model and my multiplayer friend's character model on the overworld while the overworld music plays. And then we can each get into random battles and then we fight our ways through gyms together. And that is not a thing that exists. There's no overworld that is multiplayer. I mean, there's that, like, dream world thing that came out with the last game, but that's under very specific circumstances, and you don't actually directly interact with each other. You're, like, in, like, an alternate dimension or a sub-layer of your your friend's world and it's 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 a little bit weird and complicated and i never got a chance to fully utilize it because now, frankly again, I, I don't know people still have no idea what it is like and i've read about it and i've read articles and heard it described and it's like yeah dream world and multiplayer but it's still just a vague haze for me mm-hmm yeah, no, I, I feel that way, and I've actually kind of used it, so. <laughs> there's there's no winning there. There really isn't. There, I don't remember if it was black or it was just a prototype for a future generation, but was there, like, a camera perspective change? Like, a huge graphical shift? Yes, that was in that was in black. It was, you know, you'd be walking over a bridge, and all of a sudden things would turn, and the perspective would change. Um, or you'd get, like, a look at, like, the landscape. Like, oh, you'd be able to check out the upcoming view of the city that you were about to walk into. It was, it was four specific areas. They changed the camera angle very deliberately. Uh. Um, it was more like a... I don't want to call it cinematography because it's still like very low polygon, but uh-huh. it's but that's basically what it was there for. It was like you know the the directors grabbing the camera and turning it for this specific area for this specific instance. Cool. So, do you prefer that to the old way? Uh, it was a little bit disorienting at first, but I think it's really cool, and I like that they're doing something different. I I'm not one of those people who like clings to all of the clunky old mechanics just because they were there first. Right. Um, That seems legit. You know, science, you gotta change with the facts, bro. (laughs) Indeed. So, like, I don't really need it to be, you know, up, down, left, right, 2D. I mean, if, if that were the case and all of the old things were better simply for being old, we'd have never gone up to color. Well, for that matter, we would never have gone to using fire to cook our food and just be eating it raw. I was referring specifically to game media, but yep, sure, you can take it to that extreme, I guess. Have you considered the version-exclusive Pokemon, and what color did you get? Um... I was going with the sequel to the one that I had picked up originally. I picked up black the first time around, and so I picked up black too this time around. And there were a couple of exclusives that... Honestly, I think I liked the exclusives better from white, but everyone I knew was getting white, and so it was a matter of, okay, I I need you guys to get me copies of these Pokemon, is what it turned into. And since I knew a whole bunch of people who had white, I was not going to run short of people who would want to trade with me because then I would have exclusives that I would have a bit of an advantage with. There's no Seems like a good strategy. <laughs> there's no option to just give away a Pokemon. Like you need to go out and catch like some trash Pokemon so, for the purpose of trading it. And it's very silly it- that you can't just give your friend stuff like yeah i would like to trade this weedle for this zekrom that's Mm -hmm. legit yeah like i i i don't know 
And there are ways to transfer over your old Pokemon from older, um, from previous DS release versions. Um, you have to beat the whole main story before you can do that, though. Ah. Uh. Before it will unlock that option. Well, I'm looking at the exclusive list, and I have to say that Grumpig is a pretty funny name. Because it's like a grumpy pig. Grum and pig. That is precisely oh, well. the entire point, Pyro. <laughs> Yay, I'm eight year old. Way to pick up on that word. Way to pick up on that word play. I like Pokemans. (laughs) Are we really having this conversation on the radio? What is this? I don't even. But yeah, looking forward to getting my hands on this if for no other reason than to check. Usually, what what I honestly, and this is going to sound super dorky, but what I look forward to the most about a new Pokemon release is all the little tweaks to the UI. Ooh. Like, there's there's usually just some little thing that I'm like... And this is one of those reasons why I don't go back and play old versions, generally. With the exception of Heart Gold, which I still play because Pokewalker. <laughs> I'm Ooh, telling Poke you guys, Walker. that peripheral needs to make a comeback. Or a new version I of agree. it. Because... That thing I have was amazing. Seen people at the checkout line in the Asian market, and the cashier is like, "I see you're wearing a Poke Walker. I have a Poke Walker," and then they do their little laser beam sinky thing. And it's like, "Yay, we get points and high fives." And there's always a good thing when spontaneous high fives are occurring. So, I mean, yeah, there's that. And uh, the the point I was trying to make was that I don't I generally don't go back to these old versions because there will be some tweak some little f- change in the way that the user interface is presented or the way that you the the way that you would interact with the game that just gets tightened up or polished or they add something and then I just go oh this totally makes sense I can't imagine using this software now without this. And like, where have if you been you ever all my did life? go back to the old versions, it would just be very janky. I mean, that would be, be like that would be like going back to a version of Pokemon before the running shoes. I when did the running shoes get introduced? Because I don't know that I've ever experienced them. Uh, I think I want to say it was like Gold Silver Crystal. I, a lot, a lot, a lot of changes came with Gold Silver Crystal. So usually, if there's some big game breaking or game changing rather thing like that, it was with that generation. But I'm not actually 100 percent sure on that. The Silver is the last version, the most recent version I played, and come to think of it, I probably did use the running shoes, and they were a revelation over not having them. Because Gold, Silver, Crystal, well, the main big change in that was, well, I mean, there, there was a whole bunch of stuff. You had the phone system, you had the breeding that came out, and that launched the proverbial thousand ships there, but... <laughs> we're, we're just not going to touch that. And was in half of them. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, it was, it was the one thing that made uh, having a ditto a huge deal. I, ditto was always one of my preferred Pokemon. Not because it was terribly useful for anything, but I always thought it was super cool. Shapeshifters are cool. Dogs are cool. <laughs> I think that's honestly, for me, the most memorable part of Tron Legacy, I'm not going to lie. Is <laughs> that line? <laughs> yes, totally. Dogs are cool. Jeff Bridges is asserting that dogs are in fact cool. It's a reason to go see the movie all by itself. I that don't know that I would dogs. go that far. <laughs> you take these things to all their extreme conclusion, then it's like, eh, maybe not so much. I'm going to scale this back. In fact, I might have to walk back the dogs are cool. 
that dogs are not cool anymore. <laughs> dogs were cool, but then they got all popular. Exactly. We're all into snakes now. Yeah, absolutely. Snakes are cool. I mean, you gotta you gotta be quiet though. You don't want that to get too mainstream. No, of course not. It's okay. It's a college radio station. Nobody's listening to us. <laughs> True. Except for the that. internet. I suppose I have to, that's have to cut this part out for the internet. It's okay for the airwaves, but not for the wires. The the way you give these deadpan joke deliveries, I'm never really sure if you're being sincere. <laughs> Nope, it was a joke. Whoa, hey. You're listening to the start <laughs> of this bumper that <laughs> you are not going to listen to the end of. Whoops, Pixie hits a button. Well, I suppose it's The auto DJ is staging a mutiny. <laughs> it appears to be. Uh, well, I mean, if you don't count on something going wrong, you ain't doing it right, right? So, hey, Correct. glad to get that out of the way. <laughs> no, I was just trying to cue up the stuff for our next break. Oh, can't play that song now. <laughs> it's it's really yes. it's really difficult having to multitask like this, I guess. What were you saying? Speaking of snakes, uh, I would spend an enormous amount of money on a collection of Metal Gear Solid games on a modern platform. Because there have been various remakes and collections, but I just want all of them. Especially now that 4 has kind of concluded the story arcs of 1 through 4. Some Somebody needs to put them all in one place so I can buy them and play them. Like all of them going back down to the first one? Indeed. Are we talking you like HD? Do Are on... you talking like HD re-release or just like basically just porting them as is? But frankly, I would accept either. Like it's always nice if you get a if you do an expensive um, graphical update to a game, but but that would be expensive and time-consuming, particularly popular enough to merit it. But that's expensive. It would be expensive and time-consuming, particularly for this franchise that has so much of that content. The cinematics right. would need to be... Uh, uh, that would just be a huge, huge ordeal. And I mean, there's enough of a market that that might be feasible, and you could certainly charge a pretty penny for it, but at the same token, you could probably just port them as is and still make bank on a, what's essentially a repackaging. Yes. And you know what? To bring it all around, if they released a collection of the early Metal Gear Solid games, the relatively low uh, system requirements games on 3DS, then that would sell me on the system. Cause that and Pokemon, of course. Apparently there is a Metal Gear Solid HD collection for the PS3 that has, let's see, MGS2 Sons of Liberty... Uh, Snake Eater and Peace Walker. And that makes a lot of sense on PlayStation 3 because to do from there, if you have a backwards compatible PS3 at least, you can play just about every single Metal Gear Solid game. You don't get them in that one bundle, which makes sense because that bundle would probably be $100 with Metal Gear Solid 4 still holding its price point. But yeah, if if you have a PS3, then it's relatively easy to play them all. But and if you <laughs> yeah, and if you've got and if you've got a backwards compatible PS3, which I mean, good on you. You have you do, to have a first generation one. Yeah, and it has to have not died by now, which is a pretty tall order. Let's not make any mistakes about that. But they did for the PS2 come out with the Metal Gear Solid Essential Collection back then as well. Well, you're in double good shape. And ca casual browsing of Amazon says that that also includes director's cuts of Metal Gear Solid Substance and Subsistence.
Maybe I'll as soon so as you've got this solid gen- substance transition substance. hits. Sorry? I might buy somebody's used PS3 if somebody's unloading one at the console transition for super cheap on the basis of just the Metal Gear Solid games. Because surely I'll be able to pick up like a, a $30 PS3 from somebody who's buying a PS4 and not even contribute any real money to the closed ecosystem platform system that I am mildly opposed to. Yeah. On that note, though, I mean, you would be getting one of the newer generations, though, and you still wouldn't have access to the PS2 ones. Oh, well, yeah, Metal Gear Solid 3 would be the only sticker there, because there was the... the collection has two in it, right? Um, let's see. We're looking at the PS3 one. Let me open that link back up. Because, actually... Now that I think about it, I actually have a launch day PS2 that still works, and a copy of a used copy of Metal Gear Solid 3 that I got by trading some discs with some friends back in high school. That is a little bit strange that you would actually have that laying around. (laughs) All right, I'm trying to get this web page to load so that I can fact check for you, but... I don't know. That would be a huge time suck. They just really need to come out with a movie and be done with it, honestly. Yes, they really do. Well, a movie series or something. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't seem like there's... It would be at all reasonable to cram all of Metal Gear Solid to a single feature-length movie because... But, like, you could certainly crank out, like, four of them. Yeah, that would probably be a good number. And there's less content in the earlier Metal Gear Solid games, obviously, because of the technical limitations of the platforms. But critics already regard the later Metal Gear Solid games as really long movies that sometimes have interactive sequences. So yeah, I mean that would be that would be interesting for me, if you know you could just sit there and binge without having to go. I'm going to lose like several days of my life here during experience the story. You know, you have pointed out the other serious flaw in my plan, which is yeah, if there was a collection accessible to me, I would not have time to play it. That so I agree with you that a movie would be a good plan. That is basically where I'm going with this. Is yeah, games are such a huge time sink. That's part of what makes the media as a whole kind of inaccessible. Is that right. if if somebody wants to recommend to you, and and television shows have this same problem, like the the newer dramas and stuff, uh, to to a lesser degree. In that, if somebody wants to recommend to you a movie. You can just, you know, spend two hours, get that experience, and then be done with it, and then you can talk about it or whatever. If somebody wants to recommend to you a game, you're like, oh, well, this might take several hundred hours of my life, and I still might not even make a freaking dent in it in the case of games like, say, Skyrim or something. Yeah. Or if it is a whole series like Metal Gear Solid. Or, uh, yeah, a long series that's broken down over several different um, platforms of hardware. That are now going to be difficult, if not impossible, to find. 100 hours is a pretty small number, realistically. I'm, 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 I'm being even a little bit conservative with these, uh, with these numbers here, but... So, yeah, you can see how uh, somebody might have a lot of reservations there. As it is... I've never actually finished an Assassin's Creed game. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that out there, and that's gonna be on the internet forever, and... It, it kind of I am shames just me a about bit. the only person in the whole world who has finished Assassin's Creed One. And I got I'm, I got part way through the first one and then just couldn't get into it. There was just it just lost me, and like everybody got super into this franchise and or things like I kind of missed. I, I'll like kind of miss a game, you know. It 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 happens. Life happens. Gets in the way. You you don't pick up things right when they become new, and then when later titles come out or something, it's like, oh well, I feel like I can't participate in this now because I didn't play the first one. Right. 
And this might even be, you know, a, a weird or dumb stance to take on that. It depends on the um, series because, well, like I people are highly like recommended. People have highly recommended me to me. Obviously, you've recommended to me Assassin's Creed, and I'm like, well, maybe I can start with two then, and that'll be okay. Or um, people have been recommending to me Gears of War because I miss those. Like I watched my cousin play part of it once several years ago, the first one. I don't. I I only have very vague memories of that, but uh, <laughs> and of course, part of it is being a little bit uncomfortable to acknowledge this stuff because geek culture and nerd culture, in particular, tends to have a really high burden of proof, where you have to kind They're of very prove vindictive. your street cred, so to speak, especially as a woman. Particularly as a woman in the in, within the subculture, yes, uh, you run into that a lot. Well, you in the general sense. By by you, I mean me. <laughs> <laughs> Glad that little lingu- linguistics joke was not lost on you. And by you, she means her. No, she doesn't. And that's what she said. <laughs> And now, just... <laughs> all of our listeners' brains have exploded. I'd apologize, but you wouldn't hear it because your brain is exploded. I'm not blowing anyone's mind here, am I? Anyway, <laughs> the point I was trying to make, and we're coming up on a break here, so I better make it quickly, or de- should we defer this to after the break? Let's break. All right. Well, I'm going to queue up another... Liner then, and we will come back after the top of the hour on Nerd Talk. And we're back. I'm Pixie. And I'm Pyrosim. And welcome to Nerd Talk. This is our last hour of the show on this fine Thursday morning, uh, October 11th, 2012. For the benefits the of those nice. listening to... Not as hot as summer, not as cold as winter. Well, maybe for you. <laughs> It's a little bit awful over here. Just a little. I, I, it will I don't... only get more awful as winter's icy grasp crushes the entire state. Anyway, but we're not here to talk about the weather. We're here to talk about Metal Gear Solid HD Collection for the PS3, which not only includes Metal Gear Solid 2, but it actually includes Metal Gear Solid 3. So that you are good to go if you own a PS3. The Metal Gear Solid HD collection, and then pick up four at retail, and you've got all of your bases covered. Alrighty then. So there's that. Anyway, what we were trying, what we were starting to get into, because we just happened upon this topic um, before the break, was that I was mentioning that you know it's it's very the 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 kind of exclusivity and standoffishness and inaccessibility of geek and gaming culture. Um, to people who are, I guess, trying to get into it, or the the burden of proof that you have to kind of prove that you're a real, legitimate geek. It definitely exists, and it's not a good thing. Yeah, this is a problem. Like, and yes, I joke around a bit that um, there are lots of people who will take photos of my Jade cosplay who haven't played Beyond Good and Evil, don't know who the character is, and just, you know, happen to see the costume and like it on its own merits. That's fine. Um, but I wouldn't say that they're not valid as gamers for not having played it. I'd highly recommend it if you can find the time and, you know, the $10 or whatever to pick it up absolutely should do it i think jade's you know probably among she's definitely in like my top three best female game characters but there is no need to simply denounce and ostracize those people who have not played those games indeed there's so many course, games in the world I've, that I've, nobody can play them all i have always 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 come at this from an approach where I really love this thing and want more people to also love this thing that I love. Right. And I the, guess the ideology behind 
trying to ostracize people who are not hardcore enough is that you want to preserve the purity of the enthusiast crowd but yeah like that that, that people who play bejeweled work. aren't real gamers or that people who play iphone apps aren't real gamers or whatever it's 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 if 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 you guys complain so much about feeling like people think that you're weird for playing games the way to do that is make it so that more people play games and then gaming itself isn't weird nobody is born with the fully formed knowledge of all video games like Athena bursting out of Zeus's forehead. That's it's, I, I think I love you a little bit for that reference that you just made right there. <laughs> people get into video games one game at a time. I mean, if you're the most hardcore gamer in the world, the first game you played was the first game you played, and you had no context for it and did not know about any other games. And, and for somebody else, that might have been old hat, but... And that, like those people would denounce you. Like, for, so sue me. I play most of most of my games. I, I, I've, I've recently joined um, PC gaming in that I play a lot of games on a desktop now rather than my Xbox 360. But I plug an Xbox 360 controller in because that's how I learned to play. That's the way that I'm most comfortable doing it. I learned to play shooters on consoles, not with a mouse. And trying to do so is really difficult for me, and so I find that I'm more competent when I can just use the sticks and the triggers that well, come with having fun a to use a gamepad. It gives you the opportunity to kind of lean back and sit a little bit away from your monitor and... Like controls fit in your hands nicely. I, I like I, I like the tactile sensation of playing with a gamepad, and there's nothing wrong with it. And there's nothing wrong with playing. But with like people will say that you do, don't you really play. play real shooters if you don't do it with a mouse, and so it's 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 really dumb, and it's really alienating. And like, why would you want to push people away from this thing, and then turn around and in almost the same breath complain that? Oh, well, you know, people treat me bad for being this thing because it's weird and not a whole lot of people are into it. Th the solution to that is get more people into it. Um, it's... It's frustrating, especially coming from, you know, being a woman and having to experience all of this with the extra added layer of... Um, what's the word I'm looking for here? As I'm, I'm trying to word this in a very careful way, but there's really no other way to put this. Being an attractive female, there's that extra layer of attempts to delegitimize my interest in these geeky hobbies, if that makes any sense. There is, and the listeners can look it up on Know Your Meme, the idiot nerd girl meme, which is sort of a good way to find all of the branches of this. They will link to them. It is a particular idea that attractive women are less are less worthy or need to prove themselves more in order to be real gamers. Yeah, like if if I'm not at the very top in kill counts then I'm not a real gamer or, or I'm, you know, just messing around with my boyfriend's stuff or something that, you know, that this is a boys club and yes, the girls can play only if they prove to be exceptionally skilled at it. Like, guys can be completely mediocre on Xbox Live and it's totally fine and nobody even thinks about it. But I'm going to get continual crap for it if I'm anywhere less than first because I'm doing worse than somebody. And so and at that rate, I have this. Even if have you this, are the best of the best, you will still. Have, I have harassed. this. I have this enhanced burden of proof, which is why, incidentally, I don't play any games competitively. I just don't. I'm either co-op or nothing. Or I'm playing by myself, or I'm playing with people that I know. But even then, there's like this, there's this added burden of 
if I can't outperform everybody, then I'm going to be made to feel like I don't belong here at all. Right. So I'd... I never got into the fighting game circuit, but I know a lot about it. Or I never got into... Well, I was a, I was a very, very late adopter of playing Magic the Gathering, but for example, I don't really play that a lot because there's that constant pressure, that need to exceed expectations, or that the expectations are so so much higher for me as a woman than for anybody else. I want to posit that the um, double bind is even more severe than that. In the case of Jenny Hanover, even if you are exceptionally good at the game you are playing, that does not really get you an exemption from harassment. And you can listen to nice audio logs that prove this on notinthekitchenanymore.com. Uh, Jenny Hanover is a professional Call of Duty player, and judging by her statistics, she is quite good at it. But even the best of the best of the best do not win every single match. And, I mean, a consequence of a multiplayer game is that somebody has to lose in order for somebody to win. And so... It, you could have at most one person who wins all the time if everybody else always loses when they play them. Mm. But in the real world... And those types of people aren't really a whole lot of fun to play with anyway. A game isn't really yeah. fun unless there's a good chance for either outcome. If you already know what the end result is going to be, there's not really... I, the, I, we, we, we participate in and we watch competitions because we want to be surprised. Right. And there's that, you know, that suspense, the, you know, I don't know how this is going to come out. That's kind of what makes it compelling content. Anyway, and you were in saying... In the real world, nobody has a 100% win rate, but even if you have a 75% win rate, people are going to jump down your throats for not being legitimate the other 25% of the time. And you can't really use numbers to argue with this kind of vindictive emotional response and even if you could argue against it the ostracism still kind of hurts yeah it's like on on the one level like a lot of people will say oh well that's just you know some jerks who are you know anonymously yelling at people over the internet or that you know that trash talking happens to everybody and you should just ignore it one, it's kind of everybody that's like a constant reinforced message so that if I run into somebody who's legitimately like a good sport, I'm honestly baffled and surprised by that. And like enough that that is what stands out. That's the behavior that speaks to me as being different and unique. And that's really sad on its own. But <laughs> basically, I've, I've talked myself into into a tangent here. <laughs> uh, it's 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 such a huge headache. It, it just, of course, I I'm probably preaching to the figurative choir here, but uh, it's 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 just so frustrating because uh, I'm 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 legitimately missing out on a huge segment, I don't know if that's the right word I want to use, of what makes up modern gaming in particular is there's a huge focus on multiplayer, particularly on competitive multiplayer. And a lot of people are really into this, and I kind of feel like I can't be because there's just all of these limits and these impositions. And what I was trying to get to earlier was that if you hear these messages constantly you kind of start to internalize them anyway, no matter what you might say about just, you know, oh, just shrugging it off or whatever. No, yeah. Things have an effect. Even even if somebody says something that is wrong, it still has an emotional impact on the people that it is said to. Mm -hmm. And for what it is worth, I am also kind of catastrophically missing out on the competitive multiplayer environment. I would say I have played fully two. Okay, I guess if you count Team Fortress, which is a bad example because which I still haven't there's played. No con 
there's no consequences for anything in Team Fortress. It's just like you go, you shoot things, you die, and then maybe one team wins or another, but if the 30 seconds later we're on a new map and we're going again and nobody recognizes anybody and you can join and leave and But I am terrified of actually trying to play this game and the, that is a really sad realization to have. Right. So it's, that is the lowest impact multiplayer competitive multiplayer in the whole world. There is not a lower impact competitive multiplayer than that, but even mm. that is scary because people will judge you. Mm. Uh, even I, I, I've been I've been branching off a little bit, little bit at a time. Um, Yumi and Sen uh, play League of Legends, and we're actually playing against real humans instead of playing against. I played against robots exclusively until what level twenty. Yep. And I did too. You and I played our first PvP match together. In fact, we I, I, won I, our first three PvP matches. Did did we really? I thought I thought I thought you had played with your sister. Nope. Uh, well, I had played bots with my sister. I'd never played PvP with her. Ah. So I mean, yeah. It, of course, you are kind of trapped with these people from anywhere from twenty minutes to an hour or more. Yeah, League of Legends is the most high impact, high consequence. People take note of each other's names, multiplayer. So that is the most vicious place to start. Oh, well, I guess, but I mean, it's all text based, so you don't have have right. to actually like listen to these people, which kind of helps. And I mean, I don't know. I I I, I guess the fact that it's that all the team chat and stuff is text-based kind of helps me a little bit. Right, and the other and that thing these is people that... are basically just generally gone. And it is minutes. very anonymous because for all that your name, your internet name is there, it is just your internet name. Yeah, so I mean, people might get really mad at you, but and they, and when they do, the boy, do they get mad at you? But um, fortunately, forty minutes later, they will just be seething with anger about the person in the next match and have totally forgotten about the previous match. That and also, um, since it's all text based, it's pretty easy to hit that ignore function. And you can actually, I mean, I know that advanced level play or whatever, you're going to need a competent team that communicates with each other, but just for pickup matches, which is all we've been doing really, you don't actually need to talk to each other at all, as long as you've got like one or one, preferably two other people who are who you are in communication with. Right. You, you, you could basically manage it with just three people. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, two. The thing about that is I play these not as multiplayer games or as competitive multiplayer games because I don't solo queue. I play them as co-op games and then the other people are just bots to me. That's Sometimes they're better bots, sometimes they're worse, but in my heart those are not human beings. I do not ever communicate with them. Um, they're in my life for this 20 to 40 minutes and then they're gone again. <laughs> and so that's sort of it doesn't feel like competitive multiplayer to me. Because you've dehumanized them. That's interesting. Well, I mean, I, I kind of try, I try to be empathetic and understanding that, and as you were mentioning earlier, that there's always a loser in these, in these games when you're playing like this. And so, I don't know. It's what what gets to me is when people are well less than gracious about it. Like I I lose gracefully partly because I lose constantly. <laughs> uh huh. But one thing I would like to point out that I really respect is that you systematically GLHF every game, and that is not something that is very common in League culture. And well, I played a lot of StarCraft two right before I came into League. Should we maybe explain like what that. that is? GLHF is an acronym that stands for Good Luck, Have Fun. And it's basically just, hello, 
have a nice match. But it's just a simple way of being courteous to your fellow human beings. Because I, 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 go, I go the exact opposite route that you do, and I try to humanize everyone on the map as much as possible so that when they get frustrated, I'm like, oh, well, this is a person who is frustrated with a situation, and of course they don't know me, and I'm trying not to take this personally. I still kind of feel right. bad if I don't do as well as I expect of myself, because obviously everybody holds themselves to some kind of standards. And, did, I mean, let's face it, losing isn't exactly fun for a lot of people. No. Un- unless, you, unless you lose in a objectively awesome way i guess i don't know how to put that like sometimes there's just a slow clap like that was a great job bro you have to just concede that you know i really got my butt handed it to me there and they couldn't have done a better job and Remember i did my best and they were better that scion backdoored our nexus and i was i was focusing him down i i like we were all there and i had to come back to defend and then I was like, kill this Scion, and he had like 10 health, and then he hit the last hit on his Nexus. I was like, oh, that came down so close to the wire. There was so much tension there. I was like, okay, well, that was interesting. There's fun in things being really close. So I've got somebody chatting with us on uh, on Facebook here. Uh, Mark wants to bring up that... Uh that one should factor in the maturity level of the players in league. That um, right. He says that older players are nicer, younger ones seem to have anger issues. I think that's a little bit ageist. I've, I've run into, you know, I, I know some players who are much younger than me who couldn't be more gracious and who acknowledge that, you know, they d- d- have a lot to learn. Or uh, Honestly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this out there right now. The younger players have more time and this is kind of I don't want to say their whole world, but a bigger part of it than it is for me. League of Legends right. is that thing I sometimes do when I'm drinking with my friends. <laughs> like, yeah, right. let's like, yeah, let's have a couple shots, and I'm going to, you know, run down a run down a lane as whoever, and we'll just see what happens, basically. Yeah, frankly, I could not care less about winning or losing if I have an interesting match. And it yeah, is that's kind, kind of where I'm at. It is an interesting match to get steamrolled and be like, I don't have enough money to buy my items, and that's not fun. But it's also not as fun to just completely dominate them and the match is over very quickly. I, I like a match where I get to buy a lot of items. And if that happens quickly, then that's also more interesting, because one, the reason that League is so high impact is that, like you said, 20 to 40 minutes is an expensive investment for somebody, and you can't back out of it once you're in. So it's like, I, I have this slog to get through with these other people. And if it's if it is a fun match, even if it is decided in the last two minutes that one team wins or the other, then the first 38 minutes mattered more than those last two. Yeah, but... Uh, That is not the attitude of some people I play with, not pointing any fingers, but some people care very much about victory. The what's the point of playing if you aren't going to win type of thing. Yeah, like I said, somebody's got to somebody's got to lose on either side of that match, and I, the the best that I can hope for is that it will be, as you put it, interesting. Like win or lose, if I feel like I've, I I would like to have done something cool that that is. Um, not even a minimum threshold that's just something that would be nice and like my my bare minimum threshold is to feel like this was an how do i want to put this i don't want to say an even setup but i flashed into baron as morgana and i popped my ult and i got a pentakill and also stole baron it was amazing and then we lost but whatever pentakill yeah, I, I would like to see something cool. There we go. That, that'll be my minimum threshold, basically. <laughs> Gosh, 
gosh. When did this become a League of Legends podcast? I have no idea. Then Jeff left. I was like, maybe maybe he's still here as a ghost. <laughs> Sen, well, the first we need to make sure that Sen isn't dead is what you're saying? Yes. But, uh... No, man. Hey, what are we doing for next week's show? I know I need to play Pokemon. And you two were going to play Torchlight? Was that correct? Have uh, you, yes, had, a, have uh, you well, had a chance to play any of that? I've played a fair amount of Torchlight. I want to test the multiplayer functionality of it, either with you or with Sen. Or but, both. But we I don't covered know. <laughs> Torchlight fairly comprehensively this episode. Yeah, either or uh, both. Actually, either or both, indeed. The thing I am curious about is if it will work without having to set up Hamachi, because frankly, that is the reason I play League of Legends more than anything else, is that it is free and it has reliable networking. Okay, granted, there was Saints Row the Third also also stuff. just works. I, I I I do find that that's one of those reasons that when I do play multiplayer, it's well either it's with you and we can work out whatever our networking setup has to be but um, for you and i we've already invested the five hours it takes to get vpn set up and so now that we have it we have that vpn set up already there yeah but But. like in general though i i generally am like well i could get on i could try and find somebody on my steam steam list to play borderlands with which will require huge amounts of work like you've mentioned to try and get our games to talk to each other, or I can just play it on my Xbox and know that it will just work. And that's what it's and I feel like, going to do. Yeah, that is a huge failing of PC gaming at the moment, and it is something that I feel like will be resolved in a couple of years. Then, listeners, if the IPv6 transition is in the news, know in your heart that that is a good thing, because that's going to make uh, PC gaming networking so much better, but you know, you get what you pay for, kind of with Xbox Live Gold. It's not very expensive, and having multiplayer that works all the time is good. But I mean, that, that that's one of the one of the huge draws to playing cooperatively in Saints Row the Third is like we can just go, oh, here's a game invite, and it just works, and yeah, I don't have to it, set anything like up, no and I don't have to mess with. Think. Yeah, I don't have to mess with anything. I don't have to download anything else. We don't have to test things a billion times. It's It just works. There's just function, and I don't have to invest a whole lot of myself into getting that functionality out of it. Really baller game on top of that, so you couldn't do better. Go play Saints Row the Third, everybody. Haven't we mentioned that already? I feel comfortable mentioning it again. Indeed. It is a good game, though. It's, I wasn't expecting it to be a good game. Now that we're going back into I the way... I can understand where you would be coming from. In fact, um, I when I first got into Saints Row 2, and maybe that's an example, as you were mentioning earlier, about having not gotten into a franchise at the beginning, and then it's kind of strange getting into it, because I don't even think the original Saints Row is available on Steam. You, you, if you're playing just on Steam, you have to start at 2. But uh, when I was first playing Saints Row 2, I played like, like the first 15 minutes of it, and I was like, no, no this isn't going to be good. This is just dumb, and it's it's taking its gangster premise to be sincere, and I'm not going to play this anymore. But then there was the zero punctuation that proclaimed it as being fantastic and i read some more about it having like really both funny and emotional storytelling and i was like i I don't understand how that integrates with the first 15 minutes i saw so i went in and i got to 15 minutes plus five i was like oh okay oh this is actually legit and then it was awesome and i played that whole game and enjoyed it tremendously. Yeah, it's it's very easy to get scared off on a title, especially because games are such a huge investment, and sometimes there's a very delayed payoff. I we mentioned this a lot um, back when Final Fantasy 13 came out, that one of our friends absolutely loved it, 
at about like 40 plus hours in. Right. And it's like some people just aren't willing to give it that chance. Or, 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 you know, worse yet, it's, it's one thing to be able to go, okay, maybe that's true, but I don't feel like I want to invest in that to get that payoff. It's even worse when you don't know that the payoff is there, and so you make a judgment call based on either no information or a very small amount of information, and then not knowing that this is going to turn around later, and you have to be told about that. Right. And I should emphasize that there was the gap between my first attempt at Saints Row 2 and my second attempt at Saints Row 2 was, like, over a year. But I was like, oh, this was, this was $30 I wasted. I'll just leave this in my library, and it will languish, and I'll never get back to it. But it was Games Press that got me back into it, and it, was, it is amongst my favorite games. Uh, but I also want to tie this back to you were mentioning the interface improvements in Pokemon. While I think that Saints Row 2 is an amazing game and there are some story events that happen that really change the tone of Saints Row the Third, I could not recommend anybody who has played Saints Row the Third go back to Saints Row 2 because of one particular mechanical change which is that when you're driving a car in the world and you have a GPS navigation point set, in Saints Row the Third, there are giant glowing holographic turn arrows on the streets in the world so that you can be looking at the whole screen when you're driving. I you love that. You can look at the other cars and the buildings and the pedestrians and all the pretty pictures. I, uh, I Saints do Row love the that. Two, Saints Row Two did not have that. And so if you're traversing the city, you're not looking at the city. You're looking at your mini map the whole time. I find that happens to me a lot in a lot of games, like games that have maps in general. I tend to find that I'm just looking at the map the whole time, and there's my icon moving across the map. Um, the MMOs in particular, that's basically all I remember about WoW is the map is filling up the screen, and probably behind that there's maybe some pretty pictures, but I, I'm not looking at them. Yeah, or... um. Well, in particular, it's bad as a healer in an MMO because then it's, you know, I'm just looking at everyone's health bars and also maybe a map sometimes. And I never actually see what happens in the game. <laughs> Ironically, that's kind of what you have to learn to do to be good at League of Legends. That's my that is one thing that awareness. I, yeah, map awareness is kind of a thing that I'm not terribly good at. That is... The analogy to high APM in uh, StarCraft II, which StarCraft II, to be good at it, one of the skills you have to have is simply to do a lot of things very fast. And that takes a strong attention center in your brain. And in League of Legends, you only have your one character who's in one location. And so there's only so much you can do. You have your four spells and that's it. Uh, but the way you need to have a strong attention center in your brain is you need to be uh, highly focused on your tiny s space in the map, but also be looking at the little character icons in the mini-map in the other lanes and potentially jungle and such. So, map awareness is the high-level thing that I am not very good at in League of Legends. I'm getting better at it lately, but... It takes practice. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of awful at it too because it requires me to split my focus from one very time sensitive, high demanding thing to honestly looking at the map is kind of mundane by comparison. Is that a okay comparison yes. to make? <laughs> the um, if you were looking at the map, then you have to be playing the game for kind of a different reason like the if you're playing the game and looking at your character and interacting with your lane then you're playing it for the super high engagement level like yes this is captivating my attention completely mm -hmm. and that is fun but if you're splitting your attention then you are losing a bit of the fun from the super high engagement level in exchange from the fun from winning a lot which if that's the thing you care about yeah, and it's it's not really. But 
And so I would be okay with that, sacrificing the wins for the high engagement, except what you do is you kind of screw over the rest of your team by doing that. Is there right. kind you of have dependent to be able to not sacrifice you. too much engagement because you have to still be holding up your lane very well. Oh no! What Even I mean, what I mean to say is that I would be okay with sacrificing. Okay, I just won't win and not develop the skill of map awareness. But by doing that, you are screwing over everyone else who's requiring you to go. Okay, this person is missing, or you know, I, I should pay attention to where they are, type of thing. Do you see what I'm getting right. at? Totally. Um, and this may sound a little perverse, but one of the things that I'm looking forward to when Heart of the Swarm comes out and all of the casuals get back into StarCraft, which means I can get back into StarCraft because I'm a casual and I can't compete with the hardcores, is that the game types are 1v1, 2v2, 3v3, 4v4, and you only have as many people on your team as you have actual pals in voice chat. And so instead of screwing over people who are going to get super mad about it, it's it's only you and your pals on your team. And so I, my dedication to winning is proportional to the dedication of my pals to winning. I can prioritize things appropriately. I like playing with only people I know and not having strangers on my team. So, yeah, there's a bit of that. And we got more into League of Legends this week than I was expecting to. We should probably see if Sen's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's probably dead. He was old. He lived a long life. He had a good life. It's okay, he just maybe had a life. <laughs> <laughs> he had a tall life. Kind of tall. That works. That's, He's also not that much older than us. The, I, I realize that. That's part of the joke. Way to make me have to explain it. <laughs> <sighs> okay. So next week is Pokemon and also Torchlight Multiplayer. Yeah, gee, are you sitting on any news stories that we should go over? No, nope, I, I don't think happen I to have anything well. in front of me. All right. Well, in that case, I think we should probably wrap it up simply because, well, I don't want to drag this out for longer than it's going to be any good. Absolutely. All Quality right. over quantity. Indeed. So I'm going to queue up everything I do. I do with William Shatner by Warp 11, and um, we're going to call it a day. Absolutely. So in the meantime, I'm Pixie. And I'm Pyrosim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. We'll catch you next week. Thank you.